Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. This is William Clifford, also known as Bill. I'm with the World Affairs Councils of America, and we are presenting Conversations of the C-Suite, Changing Global Recovery, and we are presenting three experts, two from Germany, one from Westport, Connecticut, on the topic of accelerating the world of virtual reality. This is an exploration of German innovation and entrepreneurship. And by the way, we're pleased to be doing this program under the auspices of Wunderbar Together. Uh, Wunderbar Together is, is a project of the German Federal Foreign Office and Goethe Institute. And it's a public diplomacy program which the World Affairs Councils of America is, is working on across the country to promote uh, public diplomacy and also to, to mark the 30th anniversary of the reunification of Germany and what that means for transatlantic relations. We're joined today by Jens Hilgers, a German entrepreneur who is founding general partner of Bitcraft Ventures, a global early and mid-stage investment platform for gaming, esports, and interactive media, which he started in 2015. Jens is also co-founder and chairman of esports team G2 Esports, one of the world's most valuable esports organization. He's widely considered uh, 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 an entrepreneur, really the godfather of this particular niche um, when he developed in 1997 the first esports online platform, gamers.de. Thomas Heilman is a German Bundestag member from the CDU-CSU union parties uh, since 2017. Thomas is also an attorney and authored the recently published political bestseller, Neustadt, in which he and other members of parliament and experts presented over a hundred proposals for the modernization of the German state. Thomas also became known as a co-founder, startup financier, and small shareholder of various startups. I won't name them because I might not be able to pronounce them, but he's clearly a gentleman of, of experience both in business and in politics, and he guides uh, and is responsible for Germany's public policy on the digital agenda. And moderating the, moderating the conversation today is Teresa Miles Walsh, CEO and Managing Director of Access Media Advisory, both in the US and in the UK. She has over 30 years of corporate finance and strategic advisory experience with the last 25 years focused exclusively on the media and telecommunications sectors. Much of her experience was spent in London with Merrill Lynch. She became the vice chairman of the European telecoms media and technology groups for Merrill and participated in transactions totaling in excess of $75 billion in deal value. Teresa, it's great to have you. Welcome, Jens. Welcome, Thomas. This is going to be a great discussion about virtual reality and the future of it. Teresa, Thank over to you. Thank you, Bill. It's great to be here. Really uh, pleased to be joining you today and nice to be with you, uh, Jens and, and Thomas. Um, let's help our, uh, our audience get to know each of you. And I'll start with Jens. Uh, Jens, could you tell us about your journey pre-Bitcraft? Uh, I, I think of you as a serial entrepreneur. How did you get started? What was Berlin like in those days? What set the companies that you founded apart? Um, maybe if you just talk about your background and then we can, we can uh, have Thomas do the same. Sure. Um, so I think starting and getting started for me was mostly a matter of following my passion. I um, was a very passionate player of video games in, in the 90s and um, when considering like, what do I, what do I do with life when finishing this sort of um, degree in um, software engineering? The choice was like, do something that you love. Um, it might make your life more enjoyable and easier. Um, so I sort of thought like gaming could be a great idea. Video games could be a great idea. Um, additionally, sort of at that point in time, sort of the, the, the 90s, video games were sort of a small single digit percentage of the global entertainment market. And I was deeply convinced that video games would become a, a dominant part uh, in sort of the next decades to come of the entertainment industry. So I saw a lot of room for growth with what I perceived as, as the greatest entertainment product. So 
that said, sort of started to build uh, my first company, bootstrapping it um, with sort of my own resources, my own kind of early days development skills and built the first websites. Uh, the Anchor and Flagship product was a, a kind of a website called gamers.de, um, sold that first company in 1999. And then sort of the internet bubble sort of burst, the internet economy burst, I um, sort of was able to buy the assets uh, that I sold to a company before out of uh, the bankruptcy of that company that didn't survive that sort of um, burst and founded another company that's known for um, its name, Electronic Sports League. It was the vision and um, of building the leading and largest league for video gamers, uh, a league where they would compete professionally, win prize money, determine their champions. And I was able to build that to the leading independent esports league over a time period of about kind of 15 years until I sold it in 2015. Now I built these companies basically starting off my kind of hometown and, and kind of location of birth Cologne, Cologne, Germany, um, a, a city here with about 1 million um, citizens in, in the West of Germany. Um, ultimately though, um, while sort of selling and exiting from ESL, this company that I built for such a long time, I decided that I wanted to go into a city that I believed had a, a greater sort of set up and, and greater opportunity for building new and additional companies. And that was Berlin. So it's not the country, the, the city that I chose first to begin my entrepreneurial career, um, even though, and, and, and Thomas will remember that very well, uh, sort of in, in those kind of first internet years, um, kind of before 2000, Berlin was already the place to be. Um, a very fascinating uh, kind of city, which brought forward a lot of successful startups, um, tech startups in, in Germany. But ultimately, Berlin has attracted me. And, and looking back the last sort of five, six, seven years now, uh, being here in Berlin um, for the right reasons. So that's, that's um, when sort of also 2050 here in Berlin, I started to invest in companies and sort of dedicate my time in helping entrepreneurs to build successful businesses in this sector, the video games and esports sector. Excellent. Now, Thomas, you made the shift from executive of a big advertising firm to become a politician. You, uh, you re represent Berlin with a focus on resp and responsibility for digital policy and labor and social is issues, which sounds like a pretty big and, and drastic career change. <laughs> um, could you give us a bit about your background and then what you're doing now? Uh, I, I have many careers. Um, I've been the CEO and shareholder of the largest independent uh, agency in Europe, but I stopped doing this in the mid 2000s uh, to be an investor in startups. Um, many of them are not pronounceable to Americans, <laughs> as Bill said. One you probably can pronounce is Facebook. I became in 2007 one of the first investors uh, uh, from Europe in Facebook. Uh, that, so this is my second career, a startup uh, investor and uh, and founder. My third career is in Save the Children. I, I've been for 12 years in Save the Children, an executive. Uh, I've been a member of the worldwide board of Save the Children. And then I changed in, so, so I did four changes, if you want to say so. And then I, I, I became senator and member of German parliament. Um, where I am an advocate for the transformation of Europe and specifically Germany, because uh, you know the, the big advantages uh, of uh, Germany is that we have a better function state, better infrastructure, uh, uh, better administration than the U.S. That that could be a competitive advantage. Um, our social system is is much better. Um, people trust it in it. Um, people trust in our our law. Um, uh, and this need an update, you know, we need to become better in digital times. Excellent. Um, it would be really great for us to all hear how you two came to know each other and also to understand if in Germany, there's a, is there a formal bridge between industry and policy making that maybe, you know, you two have been oh, involved with? I no? don't know Jens at all as politician. I know him as an investor, you know, I'm, I'm part of the investor network. Um, uh, and in, in the Berlin area, I'm pretty much profile because I do investments since 1995 back. So I'm doing it now for 25 years. And there are not that many people who have invested in digital uh, 
uh, startups uh, for such a long time. Um, so I'm uh, somehow the, the grandfather of the scene, yeah, you know. Um, uh, and it's always how we met, uh, Jens and I. I'm pretty impressed what he's doing there. And um, uh, but there's no formal connection between the politicians uh, and the, the startup scene, unfortunately. And I'd say, um, from my end at least, <clears throat> I've tried to should have not go down that path to begin with. Um, the I think in sort of the early 2000s, sort of my um, touching a bit of sort of politics and and um, so local policy was um, due to sort of the sensitivity of video games to some extent. You know, like with video games, we had a couple of events where particularly kind of events like school shootings, which by the way, we had some of those in, in Germany as well. Um, uh, they would all of a sudden kind of get connected and somehow associated with video games. And that was something that posed uh, challenges for the company I was operating and the company that I was building up. Um, and um, uh, to that extent, sort of, I was trying to build relationships with lawmakers, um, with particularly the local state government in that state that I was building my company out of to begin with. Um, but I sort of was a bit discouraged because I felt you're, you're, sort, of, you're sort of working against, against windmills here. It was not the pace. It was not the, um, the um, I'd say, the sort of agility that, and the openness that I would have wished I would have found um, to educate. Um, this, I'd say, generally... Um, older generations that would be sort of meeting with me on, 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 on these issues on how video games function, where do they come from? How do they sort of, who's playing those? How do they interact with video games? And um, that was discouraging for me. Um, I stopped these approaches to a large extent. Um, now, I think these issues have, have sort of grown themselves out of that problem, like the issues around video games um, uh, for, for good. So maybe that was the right approach here in Berlin. I'm glad that sort of, even when I moved here Berlin, which was fairly late to sort of the growth of Berlin as a startup hub in, in Germany, it is the most important city in Germany for building startups and, and, and the biggest concentration of startups. Now, I think the great part about Berlin is that the city didn't care about their startup scene to begin with. Like, I, I think there's a, a lot of, good about politics and local government not getting in the way of startups and 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 what happened in berlin was really like the startup scene took the city and influenced the city in very interesting and great ways without anybody really taking notice to begin with or sort of being in their way or trying to take advantage of it in any way and, and i think it's only recently thomas correct me here if you feel differently i think it's only recently in the last two three four five years that i think it is more visible that the city realizes what potential sort of the, the digital economy and, and the companies, which includes video games companies in the city actually bring forward. I, I totally agree. There's one, there's one, uh, um, one thing which is very important to the development of Berlin, which comes from politics and that has been done by Ursula von der Leyen, who is now the president of the European Commission. She used to be Minister of Labour back in 2012, I believe. And she, in, she invented this so-called blue card, which means that if, you, if you're a technician, specifically from East Europe, they mostly used it, uh, and you earn above, I believe it was $3,000 a month, something like around this. 3400 And you get a working permission in Berlin. And that made many, many programmers come to Berlin from Ukraine, from Russia, from I don't know where from, very talented people. They left the environment, they left Berlin. They knew that they're not one guy from Ukraine, but thousands. So they had their own community. And uh, therefore it was much cheaper and much easier to find stuff uh, who just do innovation and um, and that is a competitive advantage still available, you know, because it's really not easy to get someone to California or so, but it is easy to get someone to to uh, Berlin and it will be even easier, um, or it is easier since this year because we have again 
made it a, a little easier to get people here to get working permission. So it is not a green card lottery like in the US, it is a legal uh, right of, of people to work here in that industry. And that is something like, which made really the difference. Beside that- I fully, fully agree know, with Thomas. It, it, they haven't really understood till today. Many, many politicians have not understood what the potential is, which is in a way good. They, they don't interfere. They let just let them do, which is good too. That's, that's I, I think like when, when it comes to startups, when it comes to startups, it's like- 100,000 students in a city, which is helpful too. When it comes to startups, I like, think um, um, uh, there's two things that, that really matter to kind of create a turf in, in sort of an, an area which not necessarily has a, a thriving startup scene um, already. It's sort of access to capital and talent. That's the two things that matter most. And, and I, I see, I've seen too often, particularly in Europe, um, when they looked at technology like, hey, we want to build the next startup metropole. And, and the first thing that they do is they put all sorts of incentive schemes, like the government gives you another 200 grand if you build a startup, or we have sort of this, this support program. That's not what matters. What matters is exactly kind of trying to put in place um, sort of gi giving a ability for talent to kind of easily be accessible, which Berlin with its location is able to attract a lot of Eastern European talent, which are fantastic technical universities in, in Eastern Europe. And that talent is sort of seeing Berlin geographically as sort of one of the first entrances to, I'd say, the, the, the Western sort of part of, of, of Europe. And, and that's great. And that uh, kind of, I didn't know that it's uh, it was Ursula von der Leyen, but like, it's great to now connect the dots. And that was really, really important. And the second part, typically the best capital to come up is capital from former founders. So with Berlin being one of the first hubs and, and creating the first startups and uh, um, like people like Thomas that had their first exits early on, these is the, that's the best capital to then spark the next generation of startups and attract larger institutional VCs. And a lot of the VCs now in Berlin are actually venture capital companies that have been built by founders and are thriving now. So, so I, I think it was a great mixture, which was, was based on basically sort of a city at the right place at the right time. And, and I think good, uh, sort of good um, uh, support and ideas in terms of how to attract talent that really made the difference. So that's a good segue. You, you, you say uh, on Bitcraft uh, that you're a, a founder of founders um, sort of on your, on your website um, and that you're covering more than just video gaming and your esports, digital entertainment, uh, et cetera. Um, over the years, I mean, I'm not sure you would have imagined that video gaming could have become this big industry, $160 billion spent in 2020, 2.7 billion people playing games. Um, where, do you see, where do you see the ecosystem and the industry going over the next 10 years? I mean, it's just, it's changed entertainment wildly. So video games ultimately are um, uh, kind of abstractly speaking of virtual worlds. And I do believe that just very abstractly, um, kind of from a satellite point of view, from a helicopter view, like an increasing part of human mankind will spend an increasing amount of time in virtual worlds going forward. Um, that's the trend that we've been observing kind of in the last decades. And that is a trend that sort of has accelerated particularly now in this crisis. And I do believe will sort of continue um, with the same trajectory going forward. Now, virtual worlds are predominantly designed created, operated by video game companies and with video game technologies. Um, and they will increasingly sort of um, take over areas that you would not thought of, have thought about sort of them touching, um, which is sort of the intersection to fashion, to music. Um, they will provide environments for real additional economies to thrive. Uh, labor will move into virtual economies and virtual economies will pose a place for sort of labor to take place. So um, I think that's, that's, that's the very grand vision behind the growth of video games and where it's heading. I feel all young generations that are now growing up with my, my favorite term is digital natives because they grow up surrounded by digital device with sort of uh, access and, and, and usage of digital channels and the internet. And these generations, those digital natives, they grow up in an environment where that sort of line between that virtual world, which likely is also a video game and the 
physical analog world as we know it, that line's blurring, it doesn't exist anymore. And then you add on top of that, you add high speed connectivity at kind of broadband at 5G. And on top of that, you add an increasing amount of kind of ever more sophisticated human machine interfaces, which the most simple form of that is like my, my, my keyboard, right? Or my, my mobile phone as an interface into a virtual world or sort of a, a, a video game. But um, the most extreme side, like if we look like five, 10 years in the future is Elon Musk's Neuralink, um, kind of a direct link that connects um, the 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 um, the computer that connects the um, kind of digital intelligence with your brain that allows you to sort of um, exchange information and data directly, right? So and, and there's a lot in between, um, and that's what we also invest in with Bitcraft, and I think that's where sort of we will kind of see a lot of innovation, a lot of interesting things that are having a large impact on society uh, unfold over the next 10, 20 years. Um, and additionally, additionally, the uh, there is a development that that uh, uh, power of of uh, handholds will increase. You know, th th this is something like the amount of the brain of a mouse today for let's say a thousand dollar, and it will be in five years time the the amount of the brain of a human being, and in fifteen years it will be in one device the brain power of the higher humanity, uh, humankind. So 8 billion brains together in one mobile phone. That means you can everything do mobile. Um, you, uh, you know, the edge computing will be another very dominant uh, trend. And this all helps virtual worlds for sure. It can't, can't be different. And because the basic trends are all in favor. Excellent. Um, how would you say labor um, sort of moves into, how will labor move into virtual reality specifically? Um, so, go ahead, Thomas. Uh, I believe it will, it will see big changes in, in the labor world. Number one is we will optimize more and more repetitive work um, so bookkeeping will be not a job in 10 years time as it is today. Um, and this is only the simplest way. So, so the routine work will be called digital. That's the number one, which will become for sure. Uh, second is that the way we interfere with topics and with other people will change. I mean, Corona has speed up that development. Uh, I know so many more people who do not travel but do video conferences. And then we know we have it already for 10 years' time, but it is not as common as it is today. Corona did a tremendous job in, in that part. And, you know, uh, virtual things, you know, if, if, I, if I repair a big machine, I may do it remote uh, in a virtual world, and my, my, the robot or Etsy, Etsy uh, current machine will do it. Um, it, it's it's hard to say precisely where we are in 10 years, but it, it, it will, the way we work, the way the health industry works, it will dramatically, dramatically change. Uh, the way we do education uh, will change. Um, uh, th that's a really, really big shift. And it is, um, it is like a, another industrialization, you know, uh, the time before and the time after is completely different and it will again be completely different. And are are they, just going back to our German and American themes, are, are are German policies and some of the initiatives that you're doing for entrepreneurs to invest in these industries, um, are they you know are they very different than America? Are they are they formal? I mean, what how is that how is that sort of how how is government supporting the innovation of this? Well, the Germans are unfortunately very much cautious. You know, the, 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 you know, the, the, the principal idea is if it's not if it's not allowed, it is forbidden. And in the U.S., I believe everything is allowed as long as it's not forbidden. So, um, so, so we are a lot we are a lot more careful, um, which has some benefit in it. Uh, but it is not as easy as it, you know. You can't just try it uh, in in many areas. Uh, um, but we heavily discuss it. Uh, we will heavily discuss it, and 
uh, you know, this book you mentioned at the beginning, it, it looks like this one. It, unfortunately, it's not there in English. Uh, <laughs> um, the, uh, you know, has a tremendous support in politics where we say we, we need the way we make decisions need to be faster, clearer, more rational, more data driven. You know, it's, it's the opposite of what we see in the US where you see a polarized uh, political scene. Um, you know, we say, and uh, that's the main difference, by the way, in Corona, to my mind, you know, the, the, the Germans are very fact oriented, you know, we discuss every day the numbers and what does that mean? And do we allow parties only with 25 people or do we do allow with 35 and then uh, we test it and then two weeks later we have numbers and then we say, okay, we may, we may adjust it. Um, and, you know, it, it, and therefore we have 90% support of the population. Um, uh, because, you know, we, we say we do not know exactly what's right, and what's wrong, so we test it and then we, then we, then we reshape it. Uh, and this attitude um, needs to come into politics too, specifically to innovation, to not say either yes or no, because it's, it's hard to say what it means and then look and be quick in answers. And uh, um, uh, I would say... If, if you, I'm pretty optimistic that in 10 years' time, uh, Europe and Germany uh, will have a different attitude in, in working with it. And um, I, I believe it, it starts much better than um, what the US da does. And it's a combination of what the Asian people do, but with democracy and human rights, um, which, to my mind, a, a free society and an open markets are working much better together. Yeah. Um so, so Jens, COVID uh, has, I think many people will say, has been good to the video gaming industry uh, in a, you know, in a, in a, in a uh, the way it's performed uh, financially and just from a volume of the people spending time. Um, is there uh, any social downside to, to that, to the amount of time people are spending on video games and these immersive technologies? And, uh, and, and, and can you talk a little bit about how COVID's impacted the industry for us? So in, in the context of the crisis, I think there is no sort of social downside to video games because um, like, like what's the alternative being in, within your sort of constrained area of your apartment, your house, and sort of what, what, do you, what do you consume alternatively as media to entertain yourself, to have fun, to kind of um, have some, some leisure time? Um, video games provide the opportunity to play with friends, to meet friends, and to actually have social relationships and, and meaningful experiences together um, that sort of can be more exciting to some extent uh, than what you would probably have spent alternative uh, out there. And I think a lot of people have come to social experiences, collective experience, collaborative experiences online that they have not been trying that way around before. And, and that's, I think, been great for our industry that, that um, sort of on the one hand side, we have a large amount of gamers that played and played more during this time frame. On the other side, uh, we have been, I think, gaining a lot of new audience and, and uh, uh, people that are, have become enthusiastic about games because They've been seeing the latest generation of games which are connected, which are very immersive, which provide experiences at a level that uh, they probably didn't expect before. And uh, so, so I'd say I cannot see the social downside to that. Um, um, and and I, I think we can all, I, I, I speak with many parents that are happy that they discovered many of these online games that they were afraid of before and how actually their kids sort of spend time with that. And they were glad that they had that form of entertainment and that their kids actually kind of experienced real adventures, right? Like my kids, they, they experienced adventures here during that time in games such as Minecraft that they still talk about today. Um, and it, it sort of, it shaped their memories about this time in, in like a good way. They're carrying something good out of this. Uh, and, and I think that's something where I'm proud of our industry that, that we had a a product and entertainment forum, a world that sort of gave a bit of meaning, a bit of um, uh, a bit of excitement during these difficult times. Excellent, excellent. We're starting to get some uh, questions from the audience. Um, so I'll just remind everybody that they can ask questions uh, and if they just uh, put them in their chat box. 
Um, one of the questions, uh, uh, Jens, uh, is what are the most exciting trends and technologies you're seeing? And then uh, following that, would, uh, would Thomas invest and back those? <laughs> um, so uh, in, in, in video games, uh, the um, sort of the, the, the one large theme is true cross-platform gaming that has been becoming fairly successful with a game that I'm sure everybody has heard about, which is called Fortnite. Now, Fortnite was a game which had kind of worldwide global success um, um, at, at unprecedented scale. And, and it was different not only by being a new kind of game, game genre that it sort of defined, but by being accessible across all devices, across your mobile phone, across your desktop computer, um, and across your, your console. And you could play the very same game, the very same game world across all these different devices, which basically created one huge community and fan base that rallied behind that game. That That is something that has changed gaming and has elevated gaming. That's one big trend we're observing and, and we hope we'll continue to kind of uh, see more true cross-platform gameplay. Um, I think another sort of interesting aspect that we've been observing for a long time is VR and AR or sort of um, uh, mixed reality where for sort of the last, I, I'd say the first big investment hype in that space took, took place like about 2015 maybe and, it was probably a bit too early because the hardware, the devices, these kind of head-mounted displays, which they are, they were still too heavy. Like it was something for a technology geek to explore and to sort of put it on and like, wow, this is really different. Like that's the future, like, like so immersive. But it's nothing that you want to casually wear in your living room and play games on, right? It's nothing that you would sort of wear uh, uh, generally. So I think we're now coming at a point where in the third or fourth sort of hardware iteration cycle where the cables came off, like unlike my, my headset here, you don't have a cable anymore on the latest generation, like the Oculus Quest, you have um, embedded CPU power, you have um, a, a kind of good visual kind of quality now with the latest generation. And that makes a difference. All of a sudden it gets more casual. So we're looking forward to a very exciting time where I believe right now we're at that point that VR and AR have a real interesting future beyond the professional use cases. There's a lot of great professional use cases for VR in the last years that came forward, but on the sort of consumer side, that's an exciting topic. Um, and lastly, I want to mention, there's a couple of more trends, but I want to mention sort of a blockchain and, and sort of the, the crypto watch was a topic that Thomas is also very active in. Like, um, if we just get back to that point where I said, virtual worlds will take an ever larger part of sort of your identity and, and and where you spend your time and where you meet friends and, and where you possibly sort of uh, go on your on your job as well. Now, in digital worlds, it's ever more important that we have an opportunity and an ability to track ownership of stuff, like true ownership across, across worlds, across just one video game uh, in, 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 in sort of a, a broader um, a context. And the blockchain is a technology that we have seen rising in the last years, which does exactly that. And I think there is a, um, a very exciting future that I believe we're also right at that time where a lot of experimentation has been going on and a lot of hype has been there. And, and so I think the last one or two years were the kind of the valley of disillusionment. And now we're at that really exciting point in time where also for consumers, the technology actually is at a liftoff point. And we call that digital memorabilia, um, that, that like, which is assets in virtual worlds, digital assets that will be placed on the blockchain and thereby uh, will also help lift kind of virtual worlds um, kind of quite significantly going forward. That's probably the three things that I can think yeah. of first. Excellent, excellent. Well, uh, Thomas, you are an expert on blockchain, so maybe you can uh, tell us a little bit more about blockchain and how aggressively Germany is pursuing it and researching it and whatnot, and also if any of those trends are exciting to you as an investor. Um, I cannot too much say about the virtual world and blockchain. Jens is much more, does have much more expertise uh, uh, than I do, but um, I do think that we will get a certain form of currency. We will have still have cash. We will still have a, a, a gyro money, so money on your bank account. And uh, then we will have an electronic uh, uh, coin. Um, and 
I advocate very much that we need a, a euro um, very early and it should be like streets done by the state. So it's a platform to everyone because there's so many advantages in having this kind of a digital currency where you can combine the currency, the money with um, other interactions. So if you today, if, if you transfer or whatever uh, uh, orange uh, from Africa to, to California, you have 200 pieces of paper in between, you know, custom papers, bills, uh, loading paper, etc. And you never know, uh, has it been paid? Uh, what is it? And if you do it on a, on a blockchain, then, then uh, everything can go automatically and you do not have to write a bill and then you get money and then you have to take the money and in your accounting system, combine it to the, to the right bill, etc. This all will be gone because you would see, as it would be with the cash, you know, the, you would see the, the orange and you would see the money and it would be all in one data format. I have many advantages, many possible of uh, innovations. Um, and there's a very good reason why uh, Libra, uh, why Facebook invests in Libra so heavily. And there's a very good reason why the Chinese central bank invest. And to my mind, the European way is, you know, it will be a public infrastructure, um, but the state is not part of the, of, of the competition. The, the, the state enables competition on the platform or on that infrastructure. Um, this is my view. Um, it's not a common view in Europe yet, but there are heavy discussions. Um, and uh, next week, uh, Ursula von der Leyen is having a video call with some politicians, including me, and be discussing further, do we need it, don't we need it? Excellent. Things are changing. Um, you mentioned China there, so maybe I just ask uh, Jens first. Uh, I know, Jens, you've spent time in China. You've worked in China with gaming companies and been on boards and advising entrepreneurs there. What's your take on what's going on vis-a-vis -vis China's leadership government um, investment-wise vis-a-vis um, you know, your sector and innovation and technologies? Um, so that's thin ice for me. Yeah? So I'm, I'm just that naive German entrepreneur <laughs> that sort of uh, acquired a company once in China. I've been living for a bit more than two years in Beijing, China, uh, together with my wife. And um, so done some business there. Uh, like generally, and first of all, I was attracted by China because I was just blown away by so the speed and the effectivity of how China rose as a country, built infrastructure, um, and 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 sort of put kind of an economy together um, on on a planning paper to some extent. Uh, but it that was that was just very inspiring to me, and I wanted to be part of that. It was a big reason of why I moved there. Now, um, uh, how sort of how do I look at China now, uh, eight years later, um, and with my experience and what I see around me today. So um, China is the sort of a, a huge market in the games industry, and it has brought forward some very large games companies, uh, foremost, Tencent, NetEase. Um, Tencent is the biggest entertainment company globally, and it, it owns... Uh, a very, very significant part of games companies, including many very well-known and successful games companies in the U.S. that it acquired, uh, uh, partly entirely. Um, and um, that's been great for gaming, that that happened. Um, and I'm, I'm excited about that. At the same time, though, um, it is incredibly hard sort of to go into China and build a games business in China, as there is uh, a lot of state regulation and it is very hard to crack for an entrepreneur that is sort of uh, not a native mainland China entrepreneur. Um, there is very, very few people, like in my time in China, I met maybe five, six, seven really successful Western entrepreneurs in the tech and video game scene. Like you can, count, you can count them on two hands probably, the people that have had success in China um, when moving there and partly even being there for more than 10 years. Um, it's just very hard if you're not a local um, in China and, and really you're in a way, you're, you know your way around and, and know how to deal with, with the Chinese system. So um, we're generally not touching China as an investment uh, kind of target uh, in terms of geo today and as of today. Um, 
we sort of are still excited about some of the innovation that's coming out in gaming, like the free to play model, for example, is something that came out of Asia. Um, free to play is the sense of you don't have to pay for a game to begin with, like you will kind of pay as you play the game for additional kind of extras and whatnot. Um, Excellent, excellent. Thomas, um, do you have a sense whether German and American concerns about China, I mean, we all, I'm sure you follow what's going on with us and TikTok and other things here in America. Um, do you and does, do, do the Germans and uh, have similar uh, issues and uh, I think, um, you know, views on things like 5G and gaming and things like that vis-a-vis -vis China and Germany, um, as how, are they aligned with how we think or different? Well, it's a heavily discussed issue, number one. Second, uh, China is becoming a significant competitor to the US and to us. Um, the German attitude is probably we would like to have open markets. Um, so we keep our market open to the Chinese products and they need to open them more products. And we do see the conflict between the US and China and that may maybe makes it impossible to do so and to continue. Um, and there's no real recipe for us, what we're gonna do then. And maybe we need to, to unify more and become a third power in the world. So we have then a, a balanced power between the US, China and, and Europe. Um, but the strategy is heavily discussed. Um, and then we have the human rights issues in China, which are becoming worse. Um, and um, there's another discussion. Do, do, do that mean? Does that mean we can we cannot continue doing uh, trade with China, uh, given the human rights violations that are happening? Talking to Hong Kong, talking to Taiwan, uh, talking to the Muslim people. Um, uh, there are many issues in in, in China. Excellent. So, and, and, and quite frankly, what we find the the, the strategy of Trump quite difficult to understand you know uh, i mean one of the worst places in the world are north korea and you know he does do a peace policy to north korea but is aggressive to china that, that all doesn't make any sense to us i guess it was easy to understand <laughs> uh, we have a we have a uh, question from the audience uh for both um can you elaborate on how germany's digital agenda fits or doesn't fit within eu policy and also how does the EU work to expand opportunities for tech and gaming companies overseas. Sorry, there was a disconnection in between. I didn't get your questions. Sorry, sorry. I hope it's not my connection. Um, it, the question from the audience was, could you just elaborate on how Germany's digital agenda fits or doesn't fit with the EU policy and also how the EU work uh, to expand opportunities for tech and, and gaming companies overseas, trans you know, transferring it overseas. Um, Jens, do you want to start? <laughs> well, uh, I, I think sort of from, from what I witness um, on, on the first part of the question, I, I don't feel from an entrepreneur's perspective and from the companies we work in and are invested in Europe that there is sort of significant differences between sort of the, the major European countries in terms of how um, online technology or video games businesses can operate. That seems fairly aligned. I think the biggest difference is sort of on the data protection part to begin with uh, that poses quite significant differences between what Europe does at large and the United States. That's something that I bump in every single day. Um, but other than that, I think within Europe, it actually feels fairly aligned. And I don't see particularly in Germany how sort of Germany deviates in some meaningful way so that German online and technology startups kind of had sort of to take care of something or respect something that they sort of find differently in, in other European Union membership states. That, that's sort of my, my perception out of my day-to-day -day work. Um, I, I would add that... that, that uh specifically in the digital arena, um, Europe tries to be one market uh, and there are lots of initiatives by the European Commission to extend that. And I think this is in general common sense. Everyone wants that, you know, if you talk to detail, then, then it's getting obviously a little more difficult uh, with these specific laws. Uh, and you may have heard that the European court has just uh, cancel the privacy sh uh, shield to the US 
um, because they said the, the form of data protection is not to European uh, uh, inhabitants is not as good in the US and it definitely is. And therefore, um, per se, if, if you follow the rules in the US, that does not mean that you follow the rules in Europe, uh, which is probably in a day to day in, in such a connected economy is, uh, is a huge problem. Um, but it's a pretty recent decision by the court. Therefore, there is no strategy in place what we're going to do. We negotiate, but it's hard to negotiate with the administration now. You're in the middle of it. <laughs> <laughs> of an election. So, so it, it will at least take the next year to find out and what kind of administration you're going to get, etc. Excellent. I see Bill joining us because I know uh, Thomas has some... Uh, government business to attend to. <laughs> yes, Thomas, I understand you have a vote in parliament and we can never keep someone <laughs> from making their vote. Um, I just wanna thank you for that. And as I close, I, I, um, I ran the Berlin Marathon in 2000 and I can only imagine how it's changed since then. Uh, I'm wondering have since- you here like, since then? Have you, not been here, have you not been here since then? I actually visited in 2009 as well, thanks to the American Council on Germany, I was part of a study tour. So about every 10 years and I'm due, but because of COVID, I can't, I can't visit. Um, this weekend is very important, uh, a very important celebration of the reunification of Germany 30 years ago. And I, I just wonder, because of COVID, is this going to be marked virtually or will people gather in the streets at a distance to, to uh, you know, celebrate that very August occasion. No, there's, there's, you know, we have done something in Parliament today. Um, it's pretty, it's, there's almost no celebration. You wouldn't call it a celebration. No firework, no dancing on the street, nothing oh. like this. But it, it would be worse. So maybe we postpone it to next year. Hopefully we have. Yeah. Uh, well, a lot has been know. postponed. Jens, you'll have to get busy and invent something new. <laughs> I don't know. Maybe we can party in Fortnite. How about that? There we go. Solution. I'll have to start. I, I'm, I'm not sure that. if that is US turf, though, that we celebrate in there technically, <laughs> legally. Huh? <laughs> <laughs> well, I want to thank Jens Hilger, Hilgers, Thomas Heilman, and Teresa Miles Walsh for bringing us this fabulous com conversation as part of Wunderbar Together. Uh, the World Affairs Councils of America really appreciates the opportunity to work with the German Federal Foreign Office and the Goethe Institute to present uh, public diplomacy on issues not only limited to uh, technology and, and innovation, but broadly diplomacy, politics, science, clean and green energy and social and uh, uh, cultural issues as well. So we'll continue the conversation. And our conference has one more event to go. It's on the future of work and talent. And we'll bring that to you at 1 p.m. Eastern. I hope you come back to hear from Marjorie Krauss of APCO Worldwide and Corinne Riposche of ADECO Americas on that important topic. Uh, this is Bill Clifford, president of the World Affairs Councils of America. And again, I wanna salute Teresa, Jens and Thomas for being with us this morning and in Berlin this afternoon. Have Thank a great evening. Thank you. Right. Pleasure was on our side. Thank you. Yeah, it was Thank great. You. Thank you so much, all. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Okay. Bye.